November 30th, 10.43, bright sunny day, innocent people. Truck approaches from the west entrance. Mate, mate, you can't park here! 10.45. No time to do anything about it. This is the most high-profile murder case in British history. You and Ms. Howe are defending the accused terrorist from the government. And you're from the New York Times. I don't speak to journalists about trials relating to matters of national security. Do you know of any reason which would prejudice your ability to carry out this case? No, my lord. No, my lord, I have no reason. I was drawn in by the fact that it was just, it was just a great thriller. It read, it read like a real page turner. I had no idea where it was going. The character of Martin Rose was a was a, a, a nice challenge to play. Even though Martin knew that knowledge was dangerous, what kept pushing him towards that final conclusion and finding out what was going on? Well, I think he has to straddle that line between someone who is, is very ethical and narrow-minded in terms of justice, but at the same time, he realizes that the pursuit of that could put his partner and his love in mortal physical danger by the secrets that are revealed. So it's that, it's that notion of how much do you really want to uh, bring justice to heel if it's going to mean that yourself and the person that you love may very much be in danger. And, and so there's a, great, there's a great amount of tension in that for the character, I think. What drew to Stephen Knight's script? Um, it was first um, mentioned to me while it was being written as an idea um, by working title and I was immediately compelled by the notion of a, of a contemporary English legal thriller um, because there hasn't been one for a very long time and legal dramas are the staple of, of television in the UK but not, not, um, not film and I love the idea that it, that it was addressing concerns that, that face a lot of modern democracies now. And when I read it, it also was, you know, beautifully conceived as a, a, as a good old-fashioned conspiracy thriller. You broke into my chambers. I think you're mistaken. Claudia, we're being managed. I thought it was a, just a really gripping story and a story that was rooted in reality. And that was um, a bit of an eye-opener, so I thought, Oh, you know, I liked the fact that it was socially conscious and would raise a lot of questions and be potentially quite controversial in terms of some of the things it was suggesting that could happen given the way that these justice systems and government techniques are working. Did you have to do a lot of background work on, you know, lawyer kind of things and stuff like that? Not too much. As I say, our legal system mirrors the British and I was quite familiar with it. Um, so I didn't, didn't spend too much time on that, but definitely getting to know the, the life of, of the barrister in chambers in, in, in London and, um, and in particular the legal proceedings that, that we cover in this, which is the, the closed sessions and the role of special advocate in high profile terrorism cases like this was, was very particular. What did you see in Eric and Rebecca that won in the roles? Eric, I've always loved his work, and there was a particular mix needed for the character between the sort of peacock arrogant quality of him as a, as a brilliant advocate, allied to a need for an actor who had a certain physicality and who was at ease with that aspect of the character that he spends a huge amount of time boating and sculling up and down the river. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. I mean, for anyone who's ever not tried it, it's much harder than it looks. And he, he effortlessly straddles those two things. With Rebecca, she had such a strong quality of intellect and emotionality. And they're amazing creatures together, you know, they, they, they look amazing together and they also have a great chemistry together. So, you know, that stuff, you just have to hope that works on the day, you know, when you put two actors together. But um, chemically, we got the ingredients right, I think. She's a very strong and independent woman as yeah. well. And is that, you know, true to Rebecca Hall as well in real life? Or? Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm not hardly going to sit here and say no. That would be that would be really terrible and troubling. <laughs> so now your character was just a lawyer. Now he's not a secret agent or anything like that. But mm -hmm. he was very charismatic. He was very witty. He was very ten steps ahead of everybody. Almost a little bit like a James Bond character. Did you you know think of yourself as a secret agent almost? And do you ever want Martin to you know get to that next level? No, it was very important to us actually. I remember this one of the drafts of the script that I read it started to become a bit bigger halfway through the film and I remember talking to John about that, the director, and saying, this doesn't feel right. I feel like we're, we're moving away from what's, what's true. And then, the, and then the next draft, it sort of came back to, to what you saw, which was 
Our characters never become other people. They are barristers, they're not action heroes. They're, they don't have special skills they can pull out of their back pocket all of a sudden. That was really important to us to maintain the integrity of the, of the drama and the thriller. Now, did you draw any specific real life events for this and any inspiration? Um, not really is the answer. I mean, it, it was conceived as fiction, um, but the, you know, we then went and did a huge amount of research on the legal system and the way in which it's, it's been struggling to deal with the terrorist threat. And of course, when you do that, you begin to uncover real cases which are shockingly close to what you're conceiving fictionally. And, um, but I always wanted to keep them separate because I, you know, it's not an issues film as such. It, I mean, it is conceived as a grown-up adult thriller. and. Um, the events of the film has, have, have their own propulsion and their own logic. Um, but hopefully, as, as any good form of storytelling, it, it finds a wider expression in that and, and connects to events broader than are on the screen. So how relevant are the themes of, you know, treachery and this kind of governmental conspiracy, you know, in real life even, you know, is this message real? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's very relevant, the, the themes in the film in terms of surveillance, uh, the level to which governments hold and can use information. It is definitely relevant to, to what's happening today, most definitely. So it's often said that women love a man in uniform, but does that feel <laughs> true if it's a man in a white parliamentary wig and a robe? Yeah, I don't think that too many people have got um, fetishes about that. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they do. I think you find anything <laughs> anywhere. Um, but no, I can't see that. It's it's a little bit silly. <laughs> a little it's bit a little bit silly. So what do you think the British government's going to think of your film? I'm sure they'll <laughs> love it. <laughs> I have no idea. They, you know, they, they'll, they'll probably look at it with, with a degree of bemused contempt. Who knows? <laughs> Prior to the bombing, there was no contact between MI5 and the defendant. Defense lawyers who ask the wrong sorts of questions, they're expendable. For over half a million closed circuit cameras in London, I'm sure there are at least half a dozen watching me right now. There are people who really want a conviction here. Should have kept her mouth shut. MI5 do not kill people on the mainland. Then what the hell have you got yourself into? We're simply trying to defend our client. Dump your bag, dump everything. Get out of there, now. There are powers at play that neither you nor I may even hope to control.